Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We presume our discussion uh, that uh, we are going to solve the elliptic uh, PDE and I am going to start all over again. I am starting all over again. I am restarting. We will continue our discussion on elliptic uh, partial differential equations and their solving methods in this lecture 21. Uh, as an example, we uh, take up the Laplace's equation uh, and as a brief recap, we talk about its characteristics and the boundary condition requirements for this Laplace's equation. <coughs> in the process, we start talking about general methodologies for solving PDEs. What we notice that uh, we cannot invert the A matrix. So, that is why what we do is we adopt iterative methods and we replace the A matrix by an N matrix and correspondingly the right hand side changes and this is basically the essence of all iterative methods. Therefore, we are interested in knowing the convergence uh, rate of these iterative methods there are various uh, criteria that have been talked about how we choose uh, this criteria to find out whether we have converged or not. Historically, this problem goes back to uh, the methods uh, pioneered by Jacobi, which was uh, also done later by Richardson. It was uh, improved uh, uh, simultaneously by Gauss and Seidel. These are all point iterative methods. Having um, discussed about this point iterative methods, we talk to we switch over to the line iteration methods and uh, one of the way of analyzing any of this method is trying to find out the equivalent n matrix that we have talked about earlier on uh, for these different methods and then uh, since this has become now a pseudo time integration we can talk about amplification matrix and when this amplification matrix does not depend on the iteration index we call that as the stationary linear iteration and we spend most of our time talking about this stationary linear iterative method or SLI methods and we talk about relate this SLI methods uh, convergence rate with the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the G matrix. And in this context what is important is the maximum eigenvalue of this G matrix which we call as the spectral radius and uh, we enunciate various convergence theorem for stationary linear iterative methods and uh, discuss their ramifications. Shall we uh, then begin? <coughs> See basically, um, we are uh, talking about solution of uh, elliptic equation and uh, the simplest of them all is the Laplace's equation and uh, we are looking at uh, this. And if I uh, take uh, same spacing that is uh, delta x equal to delta y, uh, then of course, that means uh, h and k will be same and we saw that uh, we get the discrete equation written down like this. This is one fourth of the neighbors. Okay. So, <clears throat> from there we actually also commented upon uh, the maximum principle for this solution. Uh, we noted that uh, if you are looking for either the maximum or the minimum, uh, it has to occur on the boundary. It, it cannot occur in the interior because interior points are nothing but averages of the neighbors. So, <clears throat> average cannot be 
greater than the constituent. So, of course, uh, it is easy to conclude for Laplace's equation the maximum or the minimum will reside on the boundary. However, that is not the case that you should be generalizing for say Poisson equation where you have a uh, non trivial right hand side. <coughs> so, uh, we commented upon also the fact that uh, direct solution of uh, linear algebraic equation like this uh, takes enormous effort uh, with a matrix size of n by n, it amounts to n q operation. Uh, whereas, uh, one could actually go over to iterative methods and hope for lesser amount of work and the oldest uh, such uh, effort is due to Jacobi and uh, which was subsequently also uh, adopted and studied extensively by Richardson. So, it is also called the Richardson method and here the point by point iteration is uh, uh, attempted by looking at the current iterate uh, for the ijth node in terms of the four, uh, the four neighbors. Okay. <coughs> and uh, we have actually uh, done this part before. So, we just note that uh, iterative method is equivalent to bringing in some kind of a pseudo time derivatives. So, that uh, uh, renders the problem a parabolic flavor in time because the characteristics are now given in terms of uh, this complex conjugate in space. So that implies that it is elliptic in space and of course, t equal to constant implies it is parabolic in time. And uh, of course, uh, as we have uh, seen this equation that we have written here, the equivalent time dependent equation we have written it down. So, we could actually also try to write down uh, an error propagation equation. So, if I make some error at t equal to 0, how that error propagates? You can follow the methodology that we have uh, seen in a couple of lectures ago for <coughs> uh, 1D convection equation. So, you can follow that and you can try this uh, what we have written down there. Now, this is one thing that um, is uh, of uh, paramount importance is uh, that elliptic PDs are always uh, even ordered because and the, the characteristics appear in as complex conjugate. So, you do have to have uh, order have to have uh, between 2 n in space and this is something uh, which might uh, uh, some of you may find troubling is the number of boundary conditions. I am not going to go through the theoretical aspect of it, but it is uh, just that note that if you have order 2 n you require n boundary conditions. And this confusion actually arises due to the way we often uh, approach this problem via separation of variable. <coughs> For example, if I were to solve uh, let us say this Laplace's equation in this uh, rectangle or the square box, what we usually do that uh, we separate uh, the equation as a product of a function of x and a function of y and then we uh, see for solving the x dependent path we need to give uh, boundary conditions on this edge as well as uh, this right edge. Uh, so, we actually uh, uh, say that we need two boundary conditions in x and similarly, we also need two boundary conditions in y that is along the x axis and along the top edge. Now, that is what you uh, would be inclined to uh, respond back saying that we need four boundary conditions. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Uh, the twist in the tail comes actually if you if you look at uh, this corresponding figure here, uh, it is almost identical. What I have done is just simply uh, rounded the corners. Now, now what do you do? The first thing we notice that uh, separation of variable is no more possible. That is no more possible because you cannot uh, split it cleanly the x dependence and y dependence in terms of the boundary conditions. So, whenever you actually do separation of variable, you do actually have to keep in mind that it is not only the differential equation that you are separating, it is also how cleanly you can separate uh, the boundary condition. It so happens that because of this uh, uh, fillet, the cornered uh, edges, uh, rounded corners of this domain uh, tells you that you cannot do it. <coughs> Essentially, what you require is basically uh, one condition on all the four edges of a single boundary. So, think of 
this whole edge as a cons uh, uh, to be part of a single boundary and that is what you see. <clears throat> uh, let me uh, just uh, give you a brief uh, history of uh, this equation, Laplace's equation. You know, during the second world war towards the end, it was Norbert Wiener at uh, MIT. He actually sent in a proposal to US government saying that we should be able to solve flow past uh, uh, aircraft by solving Laplace's equation. So, it was as simple as that. Even then, people had uh, realized the importance of this equation and it was not that one could solve it analytically. So, he suggested a numerical solution even in those ages where you did not have, uh, well you just have seen the appearance of uh, digital computer towards the end of the second world war, but he was anticipating uh, things to come and he made that proposal to his government. Uh, the war got over, the proposal was shelved. Uh, however, uh, another two decades downstream, uh, scientists at uh, McDonnell Douglas and uh, Boeing, uh, they got uh, around to solving the same problem. So, you can see that uh, solving a uh, Laplace's equation over a complicated shape uh, is something that was uh, considered very vitally important for technological development and it requires actually numerical solution. You do not have uh, any other way of solving it and that method is called the panel method. So, a subject called panel method totally depends on solving uh, Laplace's equation over complex geometry. So, that is why it is so important that we understand the importance of boundary conditions and we got to uh, apply it uh, rather carefully. <coughs> now, uh, coming back to uh, the actual methodology in solving the linear algebraic equation, let us say A u equal to B, uh, what we uh, do in the classical methods like uh, we talked about Jacobi and Richardson method uh, or the subsequently it was uh, attempted by Gauss and Sardell and what uh, in those method uh, one uh, attempts is uh, basically instead of solving this equation A, we replace this A by a new matrix N. Now, how, how, how does it happen? We have seen that like if I take uh, delta x equal to delta y, the A matrix uh, had this structure. So, I, we had 4 uh, along the diagonal and we have 1 along the super diagonal, 1 along the sub diagonal and then uh, 1 along the pitch uh, n away and another diagonal row of uh, uh, 1 uh, 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 the line which was uh, which is actually one line above the point in question. So, we do not actually solve it in this way in uh, Jacobi method when we actually ascribe a superscript here. Right? So, what we are actually doing? What we are doing you can notice that uh, we are in a sense uh, uh, recasting the original problem which was a u equal to b so here when i write the original problem here when i write all this i have all those stacks of uh, u's coming in so if i talk about uh, uh, dirichlet boundary condition it would be something like uh, uh, like this m minus 1 and minus 1 kind of uh, array. So, this is what we would be writing a u would be equal to b. So, this was uh, our uh, problem original problem, but when I am writing like this what I have done here uh, as you can notice that uh, I have uh, not tried to solve this equation, but I have changed it in what way we keep this uh, on the current level. So, what we have done is we have actually converted this problem like this. So, we have uh, 
transported all the quantities that we have on the other side. So, whatever we had here, let us let me call that as B 2 and then I have taken all of these quantities at the nth level, they have been transported to the right hand side. So, basically uh, we have uh, uh, really done this. So, if that is there, so I will just simply write here uh, u, uh, I, I think it will be u 1 2. So, these are at n plus 1th level all of this and these ones I am writing at nth level. So, I will write this, that is what we have done, is not it? That is what it means. So, what actually happened here that instead of uh, this uh, matrix A here, uh, in the Jacobi method what we have done, we have uh, just uh, changed it to a n matrix and in this case the n matrix happens to be the diagonal element of the original A matrix, right. That is how we have done. <coughs> so, uh, this is what has been said here that we actually replace the A matrix by a new matrix here. Why did we do that? Because we uh, commented upon the fact that A inverse is difficult to perform but here, if I have uh, this matrix, what we have done now, we have written down uh, this as some, I call that a B prime, okay. So, we have exchanged A u equal to B to n uh, u n plus 1 uh, equal to some B prime. And now, the whole idea is uh, this n plus 1, uh, sorry, n matrix is uh, easy to invert. Right? That's that's exactly what you're doing. This step is equivalent to inverting the n matrix. Right? Because it's a diagonal matrix, all I have to do is take the inverse of the diagonal entry, right? So that's what we have done. <coughs> so this is the essential idea in all these iterative methods that you actually uh, revert uh, to a new matrix n from the original A matrix such that uh, n is easy to invert. However, we have to keep in mind that um, this may lead to the following observation that you may uh, end up doing uh, fewer operations per step because instead of n cube you will be doing something. Uh, in each iteration you will be doing performing lesser operation, it is just simply that, right, 4 uh, addition and 1 division, that is what you are doing. Uh, in addition, you will also like to have this number of iterations required, because we keep, we have to keep doing this, we have to keep doing this again and again and again, right. And if we keep doing it, where do we stop? Oh, well, we will have to stop when we have converged. Now, what is the meaning of convergence? So, so that is something we will uh, uh, <coughs> very seriously uh, discuss. What exactly we mean by convergence? You recall that we just now uh, talked even today that uh, when we uh, solve it in an iterative manner, what we are essentially doing, we are uh, actually solving a pseudo time dependent equation hmm? with the hope that as time progresses, the time rate will be uh, 0 and then that part would be gone, right. So, convergence in that sense means that when you actually reach the steady state of the pseudo time dependent equation, right. So, that is what we are uh, talking about the convergence. So, does it actually mean that uh, this is almost equal to this? We will be all tempted to say that, because that is what I just now said, the time derivative will go to 0. But then, think of a time dependent problem if I want to 
plot u versus t and uh, I am looking for some steady state. Let us say I know the solution. This is where eventually it should uh, stay. Now, it can so happen in the process of iteration that it will decay and then it will remain straight. If I am not careful, I may actually uh, declare my convergence has occurred here. Right? So, then what happens is supposedly we just simply uh, continue further, then again we may see that uh, it may actually take much longer to do that. And this is exactly what happens in computing. So, what happens is we are not going to adopt this. This is a wrong way of uh, looking at convergence. We can always have this false perception of uh, steady state having arrived, which it does not happen. What exactly uh, we are looking for then? Look at the following uh, problem that we have some L, well, let me uh, write uh, linear equation we are uh, solving. So, this is our problem statement. This is a continuum problem. Now, what we do is we actually have a discrete uh, um, equivalence of it and that is what we solve. So, I will call that as L of h because I have chosen grid size which is quoted here as h. So, I am actually trying to get this. Now, over and above what I am doing, I am iteratively doing this. Okay? And if I do that, does it become 0? Well, the answer is no, because what happens is our solution is not the correct one. So, if I plug it in there, it will not do that. You, I will get something what I will call it as residue. That is what I have written here. All right? Equation 12 tells you that if your iterate is not a good guess, then of course, this one, the discrete operation would not be giving you 0. If it does, then you have already arrived at this. So, this is what you should be checking at, not whether the solution has failed to improve. Failure to improve with iteration could be a bad attribute of the method chosen, whereas this satisfaction that in the discrete sense, the solution actually satisfies the governing equation is what you are looking for. That is what we are computing. We are computing in the sense that in the discrete sense, the operation would reach us uh, to satisfaction. So, when, when this R n goes to 0, the residue goes to 0, that is where we have convergence. Okay? So, we need to uh, look at that. So, how do you do that? Of course, uh, I can uh, uh, take uh, subtract one of one from the other and that would give me the uh, this thing. So, at every time step, I mean every iteration step, we should calculate this L h of this and check if that has gone to our desirable level of convergence or not. Please do understand that it would never be able to take you to absolute 0 at every node, right? It will be dependent upon machine precision, it will depend on the method chosen. Uh, so, what you like to uh, prescribe upfront is that okay, I am looking for 7 digit accuracy or 10 digit accuracy. So, I will set this equal to, I will check if this is equal to some epsilon. If this epsilon, uh, I may decide from 10 to the power minus n, n could be 6, n could be 10, n could be 2. 14, but of course, you should never attempt it beyond the machine precision depending on uh, what you, how you describe the uh, real numbers, right? <coughs> yes. Yes. Oh, I think there is a, a bracket missing here, R n. Uh, that should be equal to here, you are right. <coughs> There is a mistake, I will have to uh, take care of it. So, there that is that's precisely what we are talking about. We are trying to solve uh, 
a u equal to b. So, residue is uh, defined as uh, a u minus b, right. Thanks uh, for plotting that. Okay. <clears throat> so, you see uh, this is one thing that we have to keep in mind that whenever we take the iterative method, we first of all change a to n and then we look at uh, the solution residue. Uh, discrete difference equation, not the u n minus u n minus 1, that is that's not what we are looking for. We are looking for in the discrete sense, if uh, this r is uh, uniformly going to 0 up to some tolerance or not. <coughs> so, basically then, um, we actually uh, solve an equation of this kind, right. I write uh, that altered uh, new matrix n operating over the correction that I want to perform at that level that is determined by the residue uh, calculated over the previous uh, step. So, that is that is what uh, we, we, we would like to do. So, basically uh, then uh, what happens is that u l plus 1 would be u l plus n inverse r and r itself is b. Uh, minus a u l and so we get this. So, you can uh, see that uh, uh, in a sense solving 13 is equivalent to uh, improving the solution by this algorithm where b matrix is nothing but n inverse a right. <coughs> so, uh, what we uh, need to do then uh, we need to um, ok, I think I have uh, jumped something, let me just uh, make few more observations. You can uh, very clearly see that uh, if n is identically equal to a, then what happens? B is identity matrix right and then what happens to this part i minus i and then this is a inverse b right. So, a inverse b is the original solution you know that is how what we wanted to do u should be equal to a inverse b. So, what you notice that uh, success of your method will depend on how closely this b matrix is to the identity matrix that means how close your n matrix is to the A matrix. Hmm. So, here we have a sort of a dichotomy. We want to uh, take n so that it is easily invertible. At the same time, we are demanding that n inverse A should be equal to identity matrix. So, this is a sort of a conflict and uh, that is what we noticed that uh, we picked up the A matrix and we uh, the Jacobi method what we did the n matrix was nothing but the diagonal entries only. So, of course, they are not same of course, n inverse a will not be equal to identity matrix it will uh, uh, be quite different and that would make this process slow to converge. So, what we are essentially saying that if we could have performed the magic of picking up uh, n such that uh, n inverse a is identity matrix that is equivalent to your direct solution. It is it is no more an iterative solution. You, you just got it in one stroke, right? That that is that is the solution n inverse b, right? So, basically it is a sort of a uh, demand which we are not going to meet, that we cannot really uh, have it an et2, we cannot have n equal to a and then say it is an iterative method, it, it is not going to be. Now, in that process what one uh, can do is improve upon the Jacobi method and that is what was suggested by Gauss and Seidel and here what you notice what has been done. This is uh, something that would make common sense to all of us if we notice what we are doing. Now, if I uh, let us say take a uh, 2D problem and on the one side I 
denoted by x, the coordinate or the index L, and on this side we indicate y or the index m. Then um, we are, let's say, solving the problem in a domain like this. Then you have noticed that uh, uh, in solving the Laplace's equation or the Poisson equation, we have a five point molecule, right? So if I am doing this, um, I am involving this uh, five points in iteratively solving it. <clears throat> in the Jacobi method, what we did, we kept this uh, central node at the current level while the neighbors were all at the predecessor level, right? That's what we did. Now, uh, Gauss and Seidel uh, made this observation that if I am working here, that means what? At this level, I have already got this solution. It is already available, and so is this, right? Because we have gone like this and we gone up. So the point we are making here that when we reached here, we already have this and this at the current level. And so we should use that information. If we use that, it's a kind of a hopeful assertion to begin with that this will be a better way of solving the method than the Jacobi method. And that's precisely what we have written in equation 16 here. Look at this. We are at the Lmth node. So that is why we have indicated it by superscript n plus 1. But look at uh, L minus 1 m, L minus 1 m is this point. So this is your L minus 1 m. So that point is already available at the current level and that is why we have, uh, we have indicated it n plus 1. But please do understand that although we are writing the same superscript n plus 1, there is a difference between u l m and u l minus 1 m. Because u l m we, we are trying to solve whereas u l minus 1 m we already have the solution. So that is why I have indicated it with a over bar. Okay? <clears throat> this uh, we will appreciate as we go along and now the same way if I look at l m minus 1 this point. So this is l m minus 1. This is also available at the uh, as a new estimate. So that is what we have uh, done here the last entry that we have indicated uh, again by superscript n plus 1, but to distinguish it from u l m we have put a bar over it. And uh, that is what we have said that we have uh, gone in the direction first l increasing from left to right and then we have gone from bottom to top m increasing. Now, uh, the same question that we asked before, we can ask the same thing here that um, in doing this, we have uh, probably given up uh, on the actual equation that we wanted to solve. Let us say del square equal to 0. What, what is the equivalent differential equation that we have solved? We can uh, think of that. So, uh, what we have done? So, well, what would be our instinctive guess, the Gauss-Seidel method would be better than Jacobi method or what? Of course, it is a loaded question, the answer is it better be, otherwise why should we even try or it is a bad method, we should be knowing it shortly. But the point is, what, what we are trying to do is, uh, we are trying to gainfully use the information already garnered, what we have already acquired. So, if I have this solution at L minus 1 m and L m minus 1, I am I'm, I'm going to use it. So, if I am going to use that, so the hope is that it is going to improve my convergence rate, right? That is the whole idea. So, to understand that, let me um, uh, look, look at uh, some alternative methods and then we will. Uh, in a combined fashion, we will analyze the whole thing together. Here, so far, what we have talked about in the Jacobi method or gauss seidel method, we are evaluating the quantities point by point, right? We are taking one point at a time and we are using this algorithm or the previous pages algorithm and we were doing that. The next uh, logical thing for us would be to uh, instead 
uh, do better by solving these equations line by line and that is what we are looking at. We are talking about here line iteration method. So, what we are talking about that if I am at this uh, level m, then what I could do is I could write down this difference equation, the discrete equation where um, we write down all the quantities along that same m at the same level. So, please do understand here that all these quantities are written with n plus 1 and they are all treated together. That is why there are no over bars here. So, all these quantities are the unknowns. Whereas, if you look at uh, uh, this one, what we have done, we have kept it at the old level, but although if I am doing line by line, so if I am working on this line already, this line is available to us. So, this line iteration method that we have written it down is a kind of a variant of the Jacobi method. So, I will call this as line Jacobi method, because I am solving it line by line, but I am not using the most recently available information. If I would have done, I, I should have changed this, but I have kept it at the old level itself. So, what happens is, we have this discrete equation and we write it for all the nodes. Okay? And they are all coupled equations and you can see uh, why we spend so much of time talking about solving tridiagonal equation. Because you can very clearly see that if I put all the n plus 1 term on one side and n terms on the right hand side, then we are going to get a linear algebraic equation with tridiagonal uh, matrix entry. Okay? <clears throat> so, that is what we are doing. So, to understand that, uh, let us uh, split this uh, composite A matrix into three parts, which I have uh, called here as A1, A2 and A3. And let us define them as we uh, can see. So, uh, now this uh, requires a little bit of uh, careful observation. So, let us uh, do it uh, carefully. So, if I look at my A matrix, okay, the A matrix that uh, we have written here is nothing but, uh, I have uh, collected 2 by h square and 2 by k square. This is uh, along the diagonal. So, this, this, this is nothing but the coefficient of u l m, that is your diagonal entry. right? And now, uh, if I look at uh, this equation that l plus 1 m has an entry 1 over h square. So, here I will have 1 over h square that corresponds to u l plus 1 m. right? u l minus 1 m also would have 1 upon h square. You can see that. right? That is what we have done. So, u l m has minus 2 by h square from here and minus 2 by k square that is what we have written. Now, uh, look at uh, u uh, l m plus 1 that would be So, this will be 1 upon k square that would be written here. So, this pitch is that number of points in the L direction because you have gone to the next uh, level. So, you are actually looking at the coefficient of this, this point. Now, the same way I would also have coefficient of this point that will appear here. Right. So, what happens here? I have a three uh, continuous uh, diagonal entries and this is what I have. So, once again we have a sparse matrix with this kind of uh, banded structure and what we are doing? We are writing this A in terms of uh, uh, three sub matrices whose uh, summation 
is the full matrix A. So that's what we have shown. So what we have written here, uh, this is uh, A1, which corresponds to the entries of U L M minus 1, and that you can see 1 by k square. So this is uh, this path. Rest of it is all 0. This is this. So this is our A1. Similarly, I could also take uh, this one, 1 over k square, and put everything equal to 0. That is my uh, A3 matrix. And what remains, of course, uh, is the tridiagonal matrix that we have here. Right? So, this is uh, what we call as the A2 matrix. So, what does uh, A2 correspond to? A2 correspond to the coefficient of uxx plus the diagonal part, that minus 2 by k square part is also included here. That is what we have written here. So, this minus 2 by k square comes from the uyy, whereas rest of it all comes from uxx. That is what we are doing in this uh, particular setup. <coughs> so, uh, now what you uh, have seen that uh, the linear algebraic equation A u equal to b has been written in this format in line Jacobi method. So, what we have done here, we have uh, written uh, A 2 multiplying on the current iterate. This is uh, the tridiagonal system and everything else is put on the right hand side. So, of course, um, we already know the tridiagonal matrix can be uh, inverted with uh, linear uh, proportional operation. We have talked about that it uh, takes about 5 to 7 n operations and then we can follow this methodology. Okay? So, in this particular choice, what have we done then? N matrix is equal to A2. So, this is an improvement over uh, the point Jacobi method. Point Jacobi method only had this as the entry. Now, new, this new matrix is nothing but this tridiagonal band. So, we expect it to be better because this N matrix is closer to A than the previous N matrix. The previous N matrix only had the diagonal entry matching with A, but now three diagonals are matching with A. So, this ought to be a better approximation. So, that is what we expect to have or expect from this line Jacobi method. So, we have uh, uh, now made some observation. Now, as I told you that uh, when we are working on the mth line, this was this point was available to us. Right? We did not use it in line Jacobi method. In line gauss seidel method, you just simply uh, use that also. So, basically, uh, we have put in, in the last entry here. And please do understand that this is with a bar indicating that this we take it from the most recent uh, estimate of the solution. So, what we have done here, we have done the same thing. Uh, you can notice that here I have written uh, a 1 uh, times u bar n plus 1. So, the, 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 that was this. Since this uh, uh, path was already known to us, so we have uh, uh, used that information. That is this. Now, of course, uh, uh, it, it, it becomes very messy to keep this as u bar at n plus 1. So, you will find that uh, most people prefer to uh, simplify it for the sake of analysis and write u bar n plus 1 as if equal to close to u n plus 1, uh, which, which is a uh, uh, kind of a incorrect thing to do and we will show what it actually uh, does. But still, uh, suppose we do that, then what we are seeing here uh, that we are uh, getting n now as what? A 2 plus this path. So, now uh, with that approximation that we have made in the 22, uh, we are taking A 2 plus this path, huh? A 2 plus A 1 at the current level of iteration if we assume u bar equal to u at the current level. right? So, this uh, seems to suggest 
that line gauss seidel would be even more closer to the uh, correct uh, direct solution because uh, earlier n was a2 now we have added a1 to it right so the legitimate question that arises is how good is this approximation leading to this we have made this approximation right u bar n plus 1 is equal to u of n plus 1 and this is where i decided to invest some time and think about what we have done right so let's uh, recap what we have uh, done so far see we tried to solve this equation right so this is our solution strategy we have uh, replaced a by n and then uh, driven it by the residue at that level and then operationally we have uh, gone through this okay then what would could one could do is one could write that uh, this u at n plus 1 equal to some g matrix operating at u n and plus some r n uh, r n is nothing but this n inverse b in equation 14 right so this is your r n uh, why did we uh, put all this uh, subscript and superscript superscript you already know now this uh, g n is something like what you call as a gain matrix we have just now seen we while talking about the parabolic equation we did uh, bring in the concept of the gain matrix so whatever we had at the nth iterate we multiplied it by the gain to arrive at the new level so that's where you can see the connection between the elliptic solution methodology with the parabolic solution that we have just now done so that's what we do however we must notice that this g matrix may actually depend on the level at which we are working that's why we have purposely added a subscript n okay now the same way the residue that we are uh, calculating here this n inverse b also could become uh, iteration dependent that's why uh, to cover up that possibility we have uh, called it as uh, r of n okay now this is the way we have defined the error right e of n as uh, what we have at the current level u of n minus the actual solution actual solution is a inverse b right so the current iterate minus the exact solution that's what we are calling as the error at that level okay <clears throat> so what we could do is uh, uh, we could insert all this information so now you can see very clearly g n is nothing but i minus n inverse a and this is our general linear iteration why we are calling linear because the new iterate depends linearly on the old iterate so that's as simple as that now what we could do is i could subtract from this the exact solution so that's or i could write the current iterate as the error plus the exact solution right so u n plus 1 i have written it as e at n plus 1 plus a inverse b the same way on the right hand side u n has been replaced by e n plus a inverse b okay so do a little bit of uh, manipulation and what you find that e n plus 1 is g n e n plus this path from this path we are going to get uh, g n a inverse b and we have this n inverse b at the end uh, minus this a inverse b has been brought in here so uh, we could uh, do this manipulation here uh, because in this i have kept it gn as it is but here instead of this gn i have written i minus n inverse a right so G, inverse, G into A inverse B is equal to I minus N inverse A. The whole thing is multiplied by A inverse B. And then you can very clearly see this path N inverse A, A inverse B will be N inverse B with a negative sign that will cancel with this. And this first one 
that is A inverse B will cancel with this. So, we get a very clean recursion relation here. So, now that also would uh, convince you that uh, why we called it as a gain matrix, right? Because uh, if I have the error at the nth level, I just simply multiply by the gain matrix to get the error at the next level, right? So, that is what we do. Now, uh, if we uh, keep uh, looking at it, since E n plus 1 was G n into E n, so E n I could write it as G n minus 1 into E n minus 1 and I could cascade down through that list and then I could uh, get the error at the n plus 1 at level in terms of the error that we had initially uh, incurred. That is what we have called here as E 0. Now, in the analysis of iterative method, what uh, is usually done is uh, an assumption is made that all these g i is are same and such an uh, uh, assumption leads to what we call as a stationary linear iteration S L i. If we have a stationary linear iteration, then the g n matrix, well I think uh, I have done a pretty bad job here. Uh, this is uh, this E 0 should not be here. All that we are saying here is G of n is nothing but the G raised to the power n. Okay? So, that E n plus 1 is G to the uh, power n into the initial error. So, I have lots of corrections to make. Uh, <clears throat> so, now we uh, understand if we do not, we will see it shortly that this n matrix that constitute uh, G right here uh, n inverse A. So, this n itself changes from iteration to iteration. If, if it is not so, if n is almost equal to A, uh, then of course, G is a null matrix and the method will converge in one iteration and which uh, uh, does not happen because we are looking at iterative method. Then what happens is, uh, let me write it down here cleanly. We have uh, written it down there that uh, E error at uh, n plus 1 at level is nothing but uh, this raised to the power n. So, this is not superscript, this is raised to the power n times uh, the error. Uh, incurred at the first step. <clears throat> now, of course, uh, what we are doing, we are uh, repeatedly multiplying the uh, initial error by the G matrix. right? So, what I could do is, uh, I could actually uh, write uh, this operation in terms of the eigenvalue of the G matrix. Okay? So, if this eigenvalues of uh, this uh, G matrix that we are looking at, uh, this we are writing it as say lambda j. So, we have a series of uh, lambda j. For the sake of uh, uh, simplicity, let us uh, assume all this uh, eigenvalues are distinct. If they are not, then we have to get in uh, something called uh, Jordan's canonical form, so we will not uh, like to get into, but let us uh, understand that this is so. So, this kind of matrix operation would be equivalent to then uh, writing down the initial error uh, in terms of this eigenvalues, because if I take the um, this n uh, to be uh, the size of this uh, matrix quite large, then I will get a spectrum of eigenvalues, right. I have them. So, what I could do is I could write any arbitrary quantity in terms of this eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So, if the eigenvectors are uh, written as uh, like uh, epsilon j, then the initial error that I have, I could write it as summation of 
whatever I have written there A G uh, into epsilon J. I could write that, right? I could express any arbitrary function in terms of the eigenvectors, set of eigenvectors. Now, if I am uh, multiplying it by G, then what will happen? If I if I if I do it like this, so if I write it, uh, if I write e of one, that will be g times e of zero, right? Now, so g operating on. Let me. Uh, write it like this a j epsilon j okay so of course uh, this can go in i can write it as right so this is nothing but that's your definition of eigenvalues and eigenvectors so if i do it once so i get e1 in terms of a j lambda j and epsilon j. So, if I do E 2, I will be doing this again that would be up that means the lambda j will operate g will operate on this again and that will give you again lambda j. So, what will happen is uh, in the same way I could write it like this then I will get A j lambda j square and so on and so forth. And you can uh, take this story to its uh, logical conclusion and you will get the error at the nth level would be nothing but say a j times lambda j to the power n and times the eigenvector epsilon n, right. So, this is uh, what uh, we see. So, whether the method will converge or not will be determined by what then? Will be determined by lambda j. Eigenvalues. Uh, what we are hoping that as iteration progresses, this uh, error should decay to zero. So that can happen when. That can happen when the eigenvalues have some specific properties. So let's now define one of the. Uh, defining property of eigenvalues called the spectral radius. Spectral radius is nothing but the maximum eigenvalue of that whole set that you have. If that uh, spectral radius is called uh, lambda m, then what we have written there, I could write everything in terms of lambda m. So, this is what I get. Okay? And from this equation, uh, what you can see that we are writing this error in terms of this maximum uh, eigenvalue raised to the power n times uh, the corresponding eigenvector plus rest of the term which depends on the ratio of lambda i by lambda m. So, lambda i by lambda m is of course less than 1 by definition lambda m is the maximum and you can see when that n goes to a very large value this second part does not contribute very much. As you go along, the second part is not playing a greater role. What is determined essentially is by lambda m. I think uh, we will uh, start from here and we will talk about this convergence theorem and we will uh, get some view of what is happening. <coughs>